Um, as we begin, if you wouldn't mind, um, if we could bow before our Lord one more time, please pray with me. Our gracious and sovereign King, we bow before you this morning, asking that you would give us ear to hear your word. We pray, Father, that You would use your word, your spirit would use your word as a tool to work deep into our hearts, to change us, to make us more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, as we prepare to to get into Titus this morning, we ask that you would forgive us of our sin. Whatever might be a barrier Between us and you, Father, we ask that you would that you would forgive us. And in fact, we know that through Christ we are clean and pure and white. As we confess our sin, you, Father, are faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So our gracious King, we pray now that you would work in us. And that as we study together as a body, we would be unified. We would be united with one common goal, and that would be to bring you glory. Thank you now, Father, that we can gather together on this Lord's Day for your honor. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please turn to the book of Titus. As you're turning there, if you could just give me one ear. Daniel, our Old Testament figure, he is one of two biblical characters outside of Christ that nothing, is, nothing negative is said about. The other being Joseph. Now, Daniel, from a very young age, was a faithful man. His desire was to honor his God with his life, and his life was to be characterized by one of obedience. God raised Daniel to a position of prominence. Daniel was a spectacle for other God-fearers to observe and to emulate. Darius the Mede inherited a great kingdom during the time of Daniel, And he soon realized that he needed trustworthy men to manage this tremendous empire. Darius determined to appoint 120 satraps or governors over his kingdom. Over these satraps, he appointed three commissioners to whom these satraps were to be accountable. Daniel Daniel was one of these three. And it is said of Daniel... In Daniel 6, verses 3 and 4, Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. So what kind of character did Daniel have? He was entirely above reproach. Now, we want to keep this in mind because Daniel is the type of man that we would want to lead Twin City Fellowship. Somebody who is entirely beyond reproach. This is the qualification of every man who would ever desire or hold the office of an elder, overseer, or pastor. 
And this is what Paul described for us, uh, describes for us in the book of Titus as well as 1 Timothy. Elders are to be men who are above reproach. Look at Titus chapter 1 with me, and, and we're going to just be reminded of our context here. Look at verse 5. Paul says to Titus, his disciple, For this reason, Titus, I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. Verse 7, For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but rather hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. As we've already studied, this section can really be broken up into three subsections. First, Paul is commanding Titus to establish men who are blameless in the area of their family life. And that's in verse 6. Second, Titus is to appoint elders who are blameless in their personal life. And that is in verses 7 and 8. And that is where we will be today. And then in week to come, weeks to come, Titus is to appoint men who are to be blameless in their spiritual life in verse 9. Now we've talked about what it's to look like for a man to be blameless in his home life. But today, again, in his personal life, verse 7. Now this is the part of a person's life that often brings the most scrutiny because it is his personal life that is seen publicly. Oftentimes the family is the one that begins to see the deterioration of a man because it is where a man sort of, for lack of better terms, lets his hair down. The family sees the man for all that he is. It is the wife that is the one that will oftentimes come to her husband who is stepping into the role of an elder and say, honey, I think we need to talk. And that should happen. But after the family unit, it'll be you, the congregation, that will lovingly, graciously, kindly come to the would-be elder or maybe elder holding the office and say, we need to talk. Titus Again, chapter 1, verse 7 is where we will be today. And in Titus 1, verse 7, there are five vices that we are going to examine. And we will see, well, the idea here is that we will all take the time to examine ourselves, first and foremost. We must first take the log out of our own eyes before we can go to someone else. But we need to examine ourselves first and see how you are doing before we would ever attempt to bring this to someone else. Again, just to be reminded, an overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, which is what we talked about last week. Now, a steward is one who is entrusted by God with his work. That work of an elder is is truly, it's a multifaceted work. You may be a bit surprised by a list that I'm going to share with you now, but here are some of what an elder is called to do. They are to lead the church. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12. They are to teach the saints. John 3, verse 34. They are to exercise God's authority. Matthew 18, verse 18, John 20, verse 23. 
They are to bear witness of Christ in John 15, 26, and 27, and also in Acts 20, 24. They are to teach doctrine, and they are to counsel biblically, Hebrews 13, 7. They are to resist evil, 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. They are to endure difficulty, 2 Timothy 4, verse 5. They are to edify God's people in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 2. They are to resolve differences in Acts chapter 15 in the book of 1 Corinthians. They are to teach and model godly living, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. They are to evangelize the lost, 2 Timothy 4, verse 5. They are to commission future leaders, 1 Timothy 4, 14. They are to minister to the sick, James 5, 14 and 15. And some are called to preach the word, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. It is a weighty task that an elder is called to. Men are called to lead the church of God. Men, this is an appeal to you. If you are sitting here today and you are a man, you are called to lead in some way. Some of you may be called to be elders. Are you ready? Are you going to stand up and receive the call? Are you ready? By God's grace, some of you are ready. By God's grace, some of you are eager to be ready. It is a high calling but it is a rewarding calling. It is a blessing. And I want to encourage each one of you men, I want to encourage each one of you saints, everything, as we've talked about already, that an elder is called to do, you are called to do. But to hold the office of elder, you need to be an example. No one is perfect. There is no one perfect but Christ. There is not a perfect elder. There is not a perfect Christian. But a man who steps up to the plate to function as an elder does so as a humble man. Does does so as one who knows that only by God's grace could he even attempt to do what God wants him to do. It is an overwhelming job given to God, given to elders by God, but it is for his glory and his honor alone. Amen? Amen. Your elders need your prayers. And I would ask you that you would pray that your leaders would walk in the spirit. They would be men who have, are wisdom, who have wisdom. They would be men who know their sheep Because one day, they will give an account to the members of this church. These men need your prayers, that they would be faithful to fulfill their stewardship. And Christian, your stewardship from God is no less important. 1 Peter Chapter 4, verse 10 and 11 informs us that, or and informs you that you have been granted gifts by your Savior and your commitment to your stewardship will one day be evaluated based on how you used your gifts in the church. Saints, we all are going to stand before the Lord one day and we have to be ready Where we have faltered and where we have sinned in the past, we go to God and we say, God, forgive me. We trust him that he'll cleanse us and then we get to work. 
We be about the work of Christ. What is it? It's three-pronged, right? We exalt our king. We edify the saints. And we evangelize the lost. That is our business. Amen? Amen? That is what we do. Titus was Paul's true disciple in the faith and he was left on Crete to reorganize, restructure the church. It had begun to disintegrate and what had happened is rebellious men, deceitful men entered in. They had vile motives and they sought to destroy the church. Titus, in order to reorganize the church, he was to choose, appoint godly men, faithful men, put them in the place of of leadership. And in today's text, which I've already mentioned, we will see five vices that should not characterize church leadership. And if these five characteristics do not characterize church leadership, it will help to establish order within the body of Christ and it will promote holiness within the church, which is what we need, what we desperately need. Now, the first vice is that godly leadership should not be brazen. Godly leadership should not be brazen. The word Paul uses here is self-willed. This word refers to the self-satisfied man. He does most everything right, but only in his own eyes. He is a man who pleases himself by being concerned with his own rights. He is a self-loving man with a self-loving spirit and refuses to listen to others. Other translations define this word as arrogant, overbearing, self-pleasing. The root of this vice is pride, pride at the core. Andrew Murray said that pride is the root of every sin and every evil. And I would even say that at the root of pride really is godlessness, blatant, flat-out godlessness. About pride, the Puritan Thomas Watson said, This is so rich. Listen. It is a spiritual drunkenness. It flies up like wine into the brain and intoxicates it. It is idolatry. A proud man is a self-worshipper. Throughout the scriptures, you see pride condemned. And I've given a list of of some areas in which it is condemned. And there are others. This is not exhaustive. But pride is condemned in the area of position. Only God places a person where they are at. Only God grants talents and gifts. Position is a gift. Pride is condemned in our inability. It is condemned in achievement It is condemned in regards to wealth, possessions. It is condemned in regards to your knowledge, in regard to your learning, in regard to spiritual attainment. It is condemned in regard to self-righteousness. It is condemned in regard to being esteemed or like, and is even condemned in regard to spiritual experiences. As pride festers in the heart of man, he begins to believe its lies. He thinks of himself as better than he really is and wonders why others don't think more highly of him. Often everyone is out of step but the proud man. He always knows the right thing to do and often criticize others if they disagree with him. He is the authority, so he believes. The world, as it considers leaders, it wants someone oftentimes who is the aggressor. 
The world oftentimes wants someone who really doesn't see themselves as, as incorrect. They, what they say is right and his way goes. Not always, but oftentimes. But what the church looks for most acutely is a team player. Someone who, again, who is humble, not self-willed. Some things for church leaders to think about. Church leader, do you lead with an iron fist? Are you overbearing? Are you the type of person that hates to be questioned? Do you murmur under your breath how your way is a better way? Do you seek to please yourself before others? Are you demanding? Saints, you may be I'm sorry, you may not be in in church leadership, but you can fall into being arrogantly self-willed. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, Peter proclaims the omnipotence of God and how God will judge unrighteous men. But listen to how he describes them. Those who indulge the flesh... They despise authority. They are brazen and self-willed. Being self-willed is ultimately a hateful sin. Ultimately, self-will is hateful towards God and hateful toward your brother and sister in the Lord. So, to continue, saints, do you criticize your leadership either in the, in the quietness of your own heart or to others verbally? As Peter tells us that this at its core is fleshly living. It's arrogance and it's pride. Let me ask you, what do you think would be the most God-honoring and loving way to handle questions that you have for for or about your church leadership? Scriptures never tell us not to question our leadership. But But the scriptures do instruct us how to question our leadership. What do you think the answer is? We go to them humbly. We address them personally. We ask them in love, believing the best, but also trying to get our questions answered. If you have an accusation against them, you go to them. Remember, you are not trying to win an argument or be right. You're trying to figure out what the, what's going on. Your heart's desire must be for them to be right with God. And that is, a, that is an excellent point. When you try to show someone their error of their ways, your desire, your greatest desire is that they be right with God. Amen. Not that you be right in your assumptions and accusations. If God's elder is found to be at fault, your hope is that he would repent. And what does the scripture tell us? When you, when you go to a brother and he repents, the Bible says you have won your brother. Amen. At that point, if your brother repents and you've won your brother, especially if he is an elder, it may be for a time that he would step down. It may be for a time that he would step aside and ask for forgiveness from the congregation. It may be that he would just repent because of the type of sin that it would be. It would not disqualify him, but he would repent and then he would continue on in his leadership. But if he does not repent, what do we do? We bring two or three. Peter tells us this. Matthew tells us this. We bring two or three witnesses alongside us and only at that point do we bring an accusation against an elder. If he does not repent, then at that point we bring it to the church leadership and the church leadership bring it to the congregation. But it must be done orderly. 
It must be done in the way that God demands. Any other way is sinful. Godly church leadership must not be arrogantly self-willed, but saints, we must not be arrogantly self-willed. Let it be said of you that when your name comes up in conversation, that you are never thought of as being arrogantly self-willed. Second, godly church leadership should not be belligerent. Godly church leadership should not be belligerent. In our text, this is the quick-tempered man. This refers to a man who is violent with a short fuse. This is an irritable man whose temper, temper quickly flares up. And we've all seen this, haven't we? And some of us may even suffer from this. As an unbeliever, I had a very short fuse. And I remember as an unbeliever, and maybe even as a believer, something happening, something occurring, and feeling the temperature within me rising. Can you relate to that? You feel it. You just, you feel it begin to bubble inside of you. And before you know it, you are off the handle. Well, we expect this from someone who doesn't know Christ. They have no ability to truly, in a God-honoring way, control themselves. But this in, sh- in no way should make up a man who's a Christian. It should no way make up a Christian. It should no way make up a Christian leader. We all hate a quick-tempered man, but you know who hates a quick-tempered man most? A quick-tempered man. <laughs> the Bible likens a quick-tempered man to be a fool. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says, Do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. Proverbs 14, 17, A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. Proverbs goes on to say in Proverbs 29, verse 22, An angry man stirs up strife, and a hot-tempered man abounds in transgression. An angry man, he is a troublemaker, and his life overflows with sin. That's what this passage teaches. He is a man who is characterized by walking in the flesh and abounding in evil deeds, and it does not achieve the righteousness of God, according to James. Proverbs 22, verse 24 says, Do not associate with a man given to anger, or go with a hot-tempered man, or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. A quick-tempered man, his ways, they are contagious. If you can be described as a quick-tempered man, then you will likely draw others into your sin. Those around you will learn your ways. In the home, your wife will learn to be angry like you. In the church, your fellow leaders and the congregation will also learn to be like you. There is no room for this type of leader within God's church. If you are a quick-tempered man, you wonder why your children are quick-tempered? It is because of you. If I can speak from my heart for a moment, dear young ladies, do not go with a quick-tempered man. It could be to your hurt, and you will learn his ways. Fathers and mothers, watch that your young men are not quick-tempered. 
force that out of them in a loving, godly, parental way. Guard your young ladies from the quick-tempered man. Proverbs 15, 18 teaches us that a man who is slow to anger calms a dispute. The other side of that coin is that a man who is quick to anger, he pours gasoline on an already raging fire. This type of person is a barrier to godly unity, to godly biblical reconciliation. Proverbs 16.32 says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. An angry man has an out-of-control spirit capable of some of the most vile wickedness. But a man who can control himself brings peace, brings joy, brings comfort. Rather than being a quick-tempered man, Paul instructs young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, by saying, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but rather kind to all, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. In contrast to ungodly anger, he must be an example of kindness and patience. This is not only an example in the church, but it is an example outside the church. It is an example to the lost. J. Harrison Langford, in an article that he wrote called God's Man, a Pattern for Life States, God's leader doesn't fly off the handle under pressure or inconvenience. Rather, he has standards and values. He has a line beyond, beyond which he will not go. He controls his spirit with the Holy Spirit's power. It does not control him. So then let me ask you, how do you respond when things don't go your way? When people don't consider your opinion, do you argue? Do you want to remove yourself from the situation? Do people shy away from confronting you because you, you intimidate them? Because you're a bully? Men, can your wives freely come to you knowing that you will hear them? Men, do your children easily come to you knowing that in, in no way would you intimidate them or bully them? Can your friends come to you? Can your coworkers come to you? Saints, can your church leadership come to you? If you are one who is guilty of this sin, consider Proverbs. Turn there with me. Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs 15, verse 1 says, and you're all familiar with it, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, as we consider this passage, we most often consider it in regard to 
ourselves and that our responsibility is to give a gentle answer. But often before we get angry, we, we show our short fuse. There is a conversation that occurs in our mind. It is brief and it is quick, but it occurs. We speak to ourselves gentle words internally. We talk to ourselves internally gently, reminding ourselves the truths of Scripture, reminding ourselves that the person we're upset with was created in the very image of God, reminding ourselves that we are always to speak words of edification building one another up so that our spirit will be calm. Our answer will be gentle. It'll turn away our own wrath. And then, and really only then, are we free to then communicate to that other person. It is better to say, I cannot talk right now Give me 10 minutes. Retreat. Spend time with the Lord. Come back and speak with a right mind. And to let all folly show and sinfulness flow out of your mouths and sin before our God. And men, for some reasons, we oftentimes can, oftentimes can look at a short fuse almost as a badge of honor. If that is the case with you, really, whether regardless of gender, please repent from that. That is, that is, just, that is just foolish thinking. A short fuse, whether in the quietness of your own home or on an athletic field, is simply just a demonstration of your own lack of self-control and walking in the flesh. Well, let's continue real quickly with Proverbs 15. Verse 1 again, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spouts folly. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. A soothing tongue is a tree of life. So here the the sage, the man of wisdom, writes all that the, the tongue of wisdom brings. But couched in there, verse three, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the good and the evil, the good and the bad, watching every good word that comes out of your mouth and every vile thing that exits your lips. Those are good encouragements for us. We have an all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present God that is watching us. Is there any room to sin? But when we do, we have a Christ that died on the cross. We have a Christ who when we put our hope and our trust and our faith in him, we can be forgiven. All of God's wrath was thrusted upon Jesus on that cross. And as we put our hope in him, we are forgiven. Our sins are taken away. And we can stand before him forgiven. An elder must not be self-willed. An elder must not be quick-tempered. But he also must not be addicted to wine. Our third point, a godly, godly church leadership should not be a barfly. 
This is a man who is given over to wine and this man is not fit to be in church leadership. The term literally here means wineless. And this man is not fit to be an elder. This is a command for all Christians in Ephesians 5.18, especially those men who lead and serve the church as elders. This term does, does refer to literal drunkenness, but it also refers to an elder needing to demonstrate good, good mental, behavioral, and spiritual sobriety. Idiomatically, it refers to any kind of outrageous, unconcern for others' conduct. A lack of self-control brings someone to the point of drunkenness, but the consequences of drunkenness are more than just smelling like alcohol. Foolish and abusive behavior is what follows, and Paul is condemning this as well. Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker. Strong drink, a brawler. And whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. God's leader is to be a man who is self-controlled and not ordered by outside circumstances and not ordered by outside substances. A church leader is called to be wise and this is implied by the very term elder. It is in contrast absolute contrast to one who is given over to drinking. This command demands that nothing controls you. You must be the master of every device and every vice. This applies to everything and anything that can control you. Of course it applies to alcohol. Of course it applies to illegal drugs. It applies to prescription drugs as well. But concerning the issue of self-control, this is the abuse of one thing to the detriment of other things. It can apply to our eating. It can apply to our sleeping, our working, our entertainment, and our exercise. These are all good things, and some of them are even absolutely necessary. But when done in an uncontrolled manner, they dishonor the Lord. And dear saints, I know, I know I'm there with you. This points to all of us. We all fall short. There is not one of us in this room who has himself entirely under control. James says that there's not one of us in this room who has our tongue under control, let alone every desire and emotion and thing that is within us. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You all know this, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul shows us that an uncontrolled life is the very opposite of what the Christian life should be. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, we're all condemned there, nor drunkards nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But, but, such were some of you. He doesn't say, but such are some of you. Such were some of you. But you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Dear saints, I'm here with you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. And in fact, we know from Romans, in part, not yet in full, but you were even glorified. Psalm 
saints, you are not to be addicted to anything. But to God and his glory. You may be addicted to that. A godly church leader is not self-willed, quick-tempered, addicted to wine. And fourthly, godly church leadership should not be a brawler. Should not be a brawler. And this uses, in the New American Standard, the word here is pugnacious. I, I don't want to be it, but I sure like saying the word. It just, <laughs> pugnacious, it just sounds like, oh, man, it just, it sounds sort of, I don't know, tough, mean, um, but it, I don't want to be it. This is an old term, but it refers to someone who is a hitter, someone who is a striker, someone who is ready to fight. This man is so passionate, he is easily drawn into confrontation, whether physical or verbal. It is interesting that both Titus and 1 Timothy refer to this, this disqualification right after they refer to someone who's addicted to wine. Because someone who's addicted to wine is a brawler or a crier, but oftentimes a brawler. (laughs) This is not just referring to someone who is quick-tempered. It is missing the reference to time. You understand what I mean? It's, it's the, the quick-tempered. It's, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with time. It's not talking about a quick brawler. It's referring to someone who is simply out of control in the area of their anger. They are quick to throw blows. They are easily angered in the sense that they are ready to fight. Anger, whether righteous or unrighteous, if not properly dealt with, can be nurtured to the point of pugnaciousness. In contrast to this is the man who is gentle, peaceable. A gentle man is not a fighter, but he is forbearing. He is long-suffering. This is someone who is quick to overlook an offense. He is a peacemaker. And the one who is peaceable is simply averse to fighting. Oftentimes, we as Christians, we are quick to throw around the term righteous indignation, thinking that maybe we have it. I think that we have it far less than what we may think that we do. These two terms, gentle and peaceable, are found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, describing an elder. Paul says to Timothy, it is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable. Paul goes on to even give greater detail of what a godly man is to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. He says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. Why? Because God may grant them repentance, leading them to the truth. A godly church leader must always have salvation and sanctification on his mind. The result of responding well to trial could mean the salvation of someone. It could mean the sanctification of someone. There is no room for a pugnacious man to be in church leadership. In fact, a fighter in general... has no right even to call himself a Christian. The final vice, 
that should not characterize a church leader is that he should not be addicted to money. Number five, godly leadership should not be a bad benefiter. This is the type of leader who is fond of sordid gain, the New American Standard says it. One who is greedy and he pursues dishonest increase. And, and greed, greed is often a very sly opponent. This stranger sneaks up on a man and takes him from behind. Paul in 1 Timothy 3 verse 3 warns elders to be free from the love of money. Jim Rickard, who is the director of an organization called the Stewardship Services Foundation, this is a foundation dedicated to assisting churches in the area of finances since 1978. He has shared with sadness that he has seen more pastors fall from the ministry due to greed than to sexual disqualification. To be fond of sordid gain is a love for money that amounts to the worship of money. It breaks the greatest commandment of loving God and loving others as it takes advantage of people or situations for the sake of money. And as you know, Jesus in Matthew 6.24 states that a man cannot serve both God and wealth. Money itself is amoral, but the love of money is sin and the root of all sorts of evil. It ruins men and brings much grief upon them. In a time span of 40 days, Jesus spoke of money 39 times. 16 of Christ's 38 parables speak about how people should handle earthly treasure. In fact, our Lord taught more about such stewardship than about heaven and hell combined. The entire Bible contains more than 2,000 references to wealth and property, twice as many as the total references to faith and to prayer. What we do with things God has given us is very, very important to him. Peter, speaking to the church leadership, says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore I exalt, exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be an example to the flock. In verse 2, Peter's instruction is for elders to exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily. Here what Peter's warning elders to be is active or in a negative way, do not be lazy, elders. Do not be indifferent. A pastor is also not to serve the church with a sordid desire for wealth or for power, but with eagerness of heart to serve the Lord and his people. Saints, I... I don't want to be, I, I don't mean this to be self-serving, but let me give you some, I just want to give some instruction here. Some have the false opinion that the best way to keep a, a pastor humble is to keep him poor. I, again, I'm not, I am very thankful and, and, and entirely content with, with my pay package, if I may say that. But the leadership's desire is to not see you so burdened over the issue of finances that you cannot worship freely, thankfully, 
eagerly. Now, each one of us, we are in the place that we are financially because God has placed us here. Some of us, God has blessed and we're, we, we, we are in a better place. Some of us, we are in not so good a place. But God is still sovereign. He is still king. Trials are for our good and benefit. But we as the body, we come together. We seek to help. If someone cannot make ends meet, we seek to help in what ways we can. Maybe it isn't financial. Maybe there are other things that we do in order to make ends meet, in order to meet needs and to demonstrate a mutual love that we have for one another. Well, the same thing applies to a pastor. And I would encourage you, and, and, I, and again, this is not the state now, but in the future, if the, lead, the Lord leads you elsewhere, you make sure your pastor's taken care of. And I don't mean to say that he's driving a, a Lexus or a Porsche or a, anything like that. All I mean to say is you make sure that he's taken care of, that he can serve you by not being overwhelmed with finances He can study the word and bring you God's word faithfully and he's not thinking about how he's going to feed his family, how he's going to get work done on his car, how he's going to make this month's rent. It It is truly mutual. The leadership cares for you and you care for the leadership. Now, no one is exempt from falling into the sin of of being greedy. All of us must be careful. Discontentment, as I stated earlier, gradually enters into the mind and slowly spreads like gain green. Contentment, on the other hand, is a treasured friend. We are to give thanks always, right? It includes here as well. Paul in Philippians 4 said that he had learned to be content in all circumstances. In 1 Timothy 6, he says that godliness is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. God's people must be content at all times knowing that God has sovereignly placed each one just where he is. God's people, I'm sorry, excuse me, rather, God has given each one of us our resources. God has given each one of us a stewardship. Whether you have little or you have much, how do you fare before the Lord in your stewardship. An elder, you elders, us elders, we must not be characterized by these five vices. Dear saints, you must not be either. You must not be self-willed, rather you must be humble. You must prefer others more and greater than yourselves. You must not be quick-tempered. In fact, you must be slow to anger. You must not be addicted to wine or anything that could control you. In fact, you are to be a controlled man. You have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. That is, a, that is an aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. You must not be a brawler. You must not be quick to put up your dukes. Rather, you must be quick to put your hands behind you and say, how may I serve you? And you must not be greedy. You must not be fond of sordid gain. And rather, you must be quick to give. You must look for opportunities to give yourself and your money away for God's glory. Next week, we are going to be looking at six virtues that should characterize men in church leadership and again, should characterize each one of us. Dear saints, we know this. We have work to do. We have good, God-honoring work to do but you are not on your own. You have God's word. You have God's spirit. 
And saints, you have one another. No man or woman should be ever isolated in God's church. Dear saints, use your resources. We have been given all that we need for life and godliness. Let's endeavor to be what God wants us to be. Dear saints, the elders are praying for you and we, we ask that you pray for us in, turn, in return and, 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 and we know and trust that you are. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word and we thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to come together as your people. We are not perfectly holy, but we do have a perfectly holy creator. We are not perfectly righteous, but we do have a perfectly righteously, righteous savior who walked on this earth and lived in a way that we could not. And Father, although we fall short, we have your spirit that indwells us reminds us and empowers us. And we have your body. We have other brothers and sisters in the Lord. Father, I pray that you would help us to make good uses of our resources and that you would honor all that we do today. We thank you, our gra- gracious King and our Master. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.